I'm going to talk about compassion today. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a very difficult subject for me. I've written on it extensively. I've thought about it. I've done research related to compassion. And I, I know too much, and it's hard for me uh, to whittle it down and make it understandable. Uh, so, and I'm getting older, so it's like, have some compassion for me if I stumble a bit, or if it doesn't quite flow. Uh, I'm, I'm going to look at two sides of, of compassion, and one side has to do with our internal structures, and another side has to do with the leaders of the world and those who bombard us with messages. Uh, I'm going to also briefly look at the other side, uh, the side that wars with uh, our compassionate nature. Uh, it is yin-yang in the human species. And uh, to start looking at that negative side. Internally, we have, uh, first of all, we have an inherited structure, brain areas that are very sensitive to our fears, that can turn on aggression rapidly. Flight or fight, it's part of us. We don't have the giant jaws and claws that allow us to be huge predators. So we can run away, afraid. Or we can join together with others, like the chimps. We can join together with others and scream and holler and say, they're our enemies. We've got to get them. Uh, We all know some of the, the horrors of war. Uh, I want to just fun, for very briefly talk about Hitler and Stalin. You know, we think about Hitler and, and what he did with the Jews. My gosh, he gassed them. He, he killed huge numbers with, with machine guns and pistols and uh, yeah. Uh, with the Jews, there were six million, it's been reliably estimated, that he killed. But listen to this. He also killed two million Polish people. About uh, 400,000 uh, Serbs. Freemasons. He got them too. About 150,000. Gypsies. And, oh, it was just huge numbers of, de, quote, deformed people. He assassinated. He got rid of. Stalin was worse. He killed over 20 million people, of his own people. <coughs> uh, he did it primarily through one of the worst means, systematic starvation. And he took all the food from farm areas all, left nothing, took their pigs and their chickens and left them to starve. Well, are we much better? I don't know. I know that our history suggests we're not. Just a couple little factoids, my gosh. We were in peace negotiations with J the Japanese at the end of World War II. We were in active peace negotiations. negotiations. They, were, they wanted to surrender. Well, we sped things up a little bit. We bombed Hiroshima and then Nagasaki. And we killed about 400,000 with 
our atomic weapons while we were in peace negotiations. We didn't have to do that. We didn't have to do that. But we did. It was a way of getting even. It was a way of making them bow down and kiss our hand. So, and then we have our soldiers, of course. And every once in a while we hear of some of the things they do, like in May Lai, uh, Charlie Company in Vietnam. They killed everyone, 500 and some people in a small village, raped the women, mutil and then mutilated them. Oh, God. At any rate, uh, and the beginnings of, of all of that are our leaders. Our leaders who uh, bombard us. Uh, and eventually it gets to be thousands and maybe millions of messages that lead us to believe that somehow we're threatened. Somehow they're going to mass and kill us off. Somehow civilization needs us to go to war and kill. There is another side though. And yes, it's seen even in little babies. Uh, I don't know if I can find where I'm at. Three months old, little babies. A study done within the past couple of years. Little babies, three months old. They're barely able to turn over, but they're shown in their crib. They're shown uh, uh, figures, Google-eyed circle puppets trudging up a hill. And with one, a triangle is pushing him from behind and helping him up. Then there's another scene, another scene where the same Google-eyed circle puppet is trudging up the hill. And this one, there's a square near the top, and he knocks the truck, he, he knocks the puppet down. The little babies spend time watching. Uh, the triangle. They'll, 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 they'll stay watching the one that helped the puppet up. And when uh, the square comes onto view, they turn away. It's, it's the beginning even the children who can't turn over in the crib, it's the beginnings of compassion. It looks like it's there. The second step. Um, children who were five babies, five months old. Uh, we're shown pictures basically of, of, of a gentle, nice character over a mean one. And the characters were, 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 were right before them. They reach and want to touch the nice character, the pleasant character. A little bit older, uh, Uh, 16 months old, something begins to happen. 16 months old, 
if children are introduced to uh, an adult who says, I'm a loomy, you're a loomy, uh, then uh, children will try and help the loomy. But if there's another person who's a, a tarfin and they say, he's a tarfin, you're not a tarfin, they don't want to help the tarfin, but they'll help the loomy. It's the beginning of us and them. It's the beginning of, oh my gosh, you're part of the in-group. Uh, and, and you're the one who should be helped. It, it's the beginning of a change. However, uh, at the same time, another little baby study, a final one. Three-year-olds, if there isn't any us versus them, Three-year-olds, they're given Skittles. They're, they're a pleasant thing to eat. And if you have two three-year-olds, they don't know each other, but they're sitting together. They're sitting together. And, and someone comes over and gives all the Skittles to one of the three-year-olds and none to the other. Oftentimes, with great frequency, the one three-year-old who gets the, all of the Skittles, will refuse to eat them. Sometimes they just shove them off. There is compassion, even in very, very young children and infants. It comes with the species. That is there, too. Uh, there's a lot of research that shows you can find the specific genomic uh, signatures that is it's part of our inheritance there are specific gene sequences that relate to inheritance for instance uh, they tested a bunch of German women who uh, were in an organization and they were asking for, they took blood samples and did extensive studies on their, their genomes. And uh, they were having a big drive to help Peruvian women, not German women, Peruvian women, who were desperately poor. They found that those who contributed most had a specific genomic signature. It seemed to be in the genes that people who wanted to help and would help uh, had a specific genomic structure. That's puzzling, you know, that, that, that makes you kind of wonder. Uh, maybe some of us have it and some of us don't to some degree. It's interesting too, uh, boy, look at different cultures. Uh, they've done some big studies on, on uh, Chinese versus American infants. And uh, this is related, but not specifically concerned about compassion, but strongly related. Now, where's my data there? I know I have it. I do. Yeah, here we are. It looks like four-month-old babies, motor activity, American kids display. You know, this is like 
you watch over 10 minutes and you're, you're carefully uh, uh, checking what's happening to the kids. Motor activity, 49 to Chinese 11. That's Chinese are almost just one quarter of the motor activity. Crying, Chinese 1 to American 7. Seven times the amount of crying in Amer American four-month-old infants. They've hardly, they haven't had time to learn hardly anything. It's four-month-old. Uh, fretting, two to ten. Five times as much fretting in American infants. Smiling, they were about even. So, you know, boy, uh, I think those are related to compassion. It's interesting that in the East is where you find a goodly number of Buddhists. And people who have listened to Confucius, and uh, and we have our Christians, uh, and others. Internally. relates to the genetic structure underlying compassion. There are some neurotransmitters, stuff that uh, is wired into our brain, allows uh, the neurons to fire more uh, intensely in certain areas, and the hormones, and the neurotransmitters and hormones, you know, there is serotonin, there's dopamine, and there's oxytocin. The oxytocin, the dopamine, are the reward drugs. The uh, oxytocin we've talked about in the past, it's, it's the love form, it's the love drug. And it, it's one of the neurotransmitters. Uh, when a mother looks at her baby, newborn baby, and the baby is suckling, the mother looks down and feels that strong emotion of tie, that strong emotion of protection, of love. It's not the mother, it's the oxytocin. <laughs> <laughs> and the baby looks up and is contented and feels love. It's the oxytocin again, stirring. It's giving a deep, deep reward and, and sense of, of union. And I think a lot of compassion has to do with the operation of oxytocin and dopamine. Reward drugs in our brain. Um, increase empathy they increase uh, they're correlated with, with altruism and with some moral behavior I'm a humanist and Humanism basically began as, as a union between science and reason. Oh. I'm a child of the Enlightenment. And I believe that we have to, we need to look at what our leaders ask us to do. We need to look at 
how so frequently they press us to go to war. They press, insist that there's a threat and that we must overcome the threat. They lie and manipulate us. I wish I had a full hour to talk about how our presidents and leaders have lied and manipulate, manipulated us. I'll just give you a, a couple quick examples because this is what we battle. This breaks into our compassion and says, no, they're a threat. They're going to hurt us. We need to kill. Woodrow Wilson, when he was being elected, there were banners up. He posed as the peace president, the person who would keep us out of war. That's, that was what he was advertising. The president would keep us out of war. A couple years later, we decided that we had to be in war. Uh, this was the First World War. We were, at the time, supposedly neutral. But, in fact, we were sending a couple billion dollars worth of, worth of munitions and, and armaments to our allies in Britain and France and so forth, while we were giving barely a bit more than a million to the Germans. Somehow we weren't neutral. The Germans, in the middle of a war, decided, this is the First World War, remember, they decided, my gosh, uh, you've got to stop this. We wouldn't. They warned us, and they started sinking our ships. Well, Wilson maintained that we weren't, so we were neutral, and here they were killing Americans, sinking our ships. We had to go to war. And we went to war. Uh, the same thing happened basically in the Second World War. Let's, let's go to Vietnam, however. In Vietnam, uh, we had Lyndon Johnson, who also said he wanted to stay clear of the conflicts over in Asia. At the same time that he said that, we had warships about three miles off the coast of North Vietnam, and we were aiding the South Vietnamese to go in our ships and infiltrate in North Vietnam. Then, then, apparently, apparently, uh, the North Vietnamese were sending torpedo boats to demolish our ships. And they were using boats to, to shell our ships. Well, Johnson said, we have to go to war. They're, 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 they're trying to destroy our, our Navy. Well, uh, the record shows now that it's available, and it is available now, that we did help the South Vietnamese and further we were we also had CIA in North Vietnam we were landing them okay in addition to that uh, the supposed bombardment of our ships never occurred and the uh, captain who maintained that his ship was being bombed, uh, the crew said, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. We were lied to. 
We were manipulated. We were pressed to go to war. It's just happened repeatedly. And of course, you remember Bush and Iraq. When has it not happened? I don't know. In the Second World War, I think there were 85 million killed women, children, and so forth. God, we need to do something. And one of the first steps is to use reason. One of the first steps is to say, when the call to war comes and they're blowing the bugles, say, I won't go. I won't go. By the way, just as an aside, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but in the First World War, when Wilson said, uh, I want troops, I want a million men. Three months later, he had 70,000. There were, there was a great song at that point in time that, that the song was, I don't want my son to be a soldier. It was a popular song. What did Wilson do? He began jailing the people who were anti-war. And he developed a huge propaganda campaign that we were just helping our allies and they, it, 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 they were going to come over and invade the United States eventually, you know, it's, oh boy. We have to use our reason. We're the most powerful nation in the world and we're still building more armaments and it's like, oh boy. Do we give in to greed and power? Stephen Hawking, you've heard of him, he's the best we have as the newest Einstein, uh, a man who's, who speaks as Einstein did about, about war and our species. In January of this year on BBC, he gave a talk. He said that Homo sapiens could cause our own extinction within the next hundred years. He suggested a wide variety of possibilities for us. One is a nuclear war with Russia, maybe. Israel might start one. North Korea could. Um, he suggested that. He suggested global warming might decimate us. He was concerned also about genetically engineered viruses. Boy. We're engineering those kinds of things now. Might they get out of hand? Might a foreign country do the same? Might terrorists do the same? Does he go too far afield? He talks about self-replicating -re robots, too. <laughs> 
they had them. <laughs> uh, he says, the next hundred years are the most dangerous. There's, an or, there's a group in the United States call themselves the Catastrophic Risk Institute. They're concerned about unexpected, maybe even unintended consequences. They're concerned about biological warfare. They're concerned about a variety of kinds of risks. Uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, famine, They mentioned that every once in a while a comic hits. And the last one uh, was 60 some million years ago. And that one likely caused the extinction of three quarters of the animal and plant uh, species on the earth. And that could occur. Yeah, in Mexico, in the middle of, uh, uh, in, excuse me, in the middle of the, the uh, uh, Caribbean, there's a huge, deep crater. It's miles and miles across where apparently this occurred. Here, here is something that's interesting too. Uh, this is a courier. It's this is an organization which. Uh, attempts to bring world leaders together to talk about ways of going forward and reducing some of the threats in the world to produce a more peaceful world. They've been working for 50 years or so and I knew some of these guys from Maryland. They worked near where I was teaching. and. Uh, they just report on loose radioactive material. The report just came out and it looks like uh, they found material being sold before it was sold, of about 20, uh, 2,730 grams. What would, it, would that be in pounds, roughly? Okay. 2,700. 500 pounds. Pardon? 500 pounds. 500 pounds of highly enriched uranium. This wasn't, this was the stuff you could make a bomb from. They have 19 instances in which they've been able to pick up uh, people attempting to sell highly enriched uranium. It's floating around. It apparently came from Russia. They weren't doing a good job of, of protecting. It's floating around. And where is it ending up? Who has it now? Who who was able to buy some that they didn't catch? They still think there's a huge amount out there. The biggest radioactive problem, by the way, is the radioactive material that is sold in <coughs> hospitals, labs, and places like that. Yes. Because a microgram of, of radioactive material could contaminate this building, for instance, and you would have to destroy it. We have the we have the ability within ourselves, many of us do, to be compassionate. Maybe some can't help themselves. 
Maybe some can't help themselves. And they have a higher amount of fearfulness. Yeah. Uh, they see threats more, more readily. In one sense, that may help our species to some, at, at times. If, in fact, we were about to be invaded and killed, it might be better to have someone who's really suspicious and who could be the forceful leader and protect. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you can't believe our presidents, our leaders, because they have over and over and over again heightened the threats and insisted there was something going on that we had to stop and we were and they've lied and manipulated us. So, it's, it's you who are the hope. You who maybe can reason. You who maybe can say, come on now, it's, I just don't believe you. You have to fight hard to keep that position. Our species is also a species that that you know, uh, tends to to adhere to a leader and say, F "We'll follow. Tell us what to do." We tend to be a species that, when we feel threatened, we want a leader. We want somebody to help us. And and that's the problem. If we did have leaders who would only lead us when the threat was real and, and, and imminent and just before us, perhaps. But that hasn't been our history. So... Um, We are surrounded by a huge number of unthinking, ignorant, and prejudiced people, uh, many of whom see the world as us versus them. And in a global, on a global level, we might be running out of time. On a global level, something like this makes you wonder, where is all of that <clears throat> extra uranium that's lost? Where is it now? And when the bombs start flying, boy, what are we going to do? Uh, maybe our species will be gone. Sometimes I kind of muse and say, we're so damn aggressive. We populated the whole earth and we decimate other species. In this country, this, this, this continent, we had huge numbers of mammals, huge mammals that were present. And well over three quarters of, the, of them we executed because we were afraid of them or they were taking the ground that we wanted to plant crops on. We destroyed them. We destroyed huge numbers of our plants too. And, you know, maybe we will just extinguish ourselves. Maybe the bombs will fly and we'll 
so he won't be able to stop it. And in some ways, maybe that would be good for the rest of the planet. If we can extinguish ourselves and the others grow up without the murderous intent that is so strong in our species. Uh, I hope that reason and some of the better science can prevail. Isn't it fascinating that the people that we admire so much, uh, the ancient philosophers, uh, Christ, Buddha, uh, Confucius, uh, they talked repeatedly about compassion, about turning the weapons into plowshares. And we listen and say yes, yes. And some of us say yes, we must do something. So I want to be friends with the Buddhists. I want to be friends with the Christians who are compassionate and don't adhere to the us versus them. I want to be friends with the pagans, a couple of them here in the room, who exhibit a goodly amount of compassion. And I hope, I hope that we can have an influence. We're a small group. But if we have compassion and, and persistence, maybe we can help in our small ways. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you.